get somebody that knows what they're talking about. This stuff can be very complex. It's not property insurance where your building burns down and you know exactly how much it costs to replace. A lot of DNO and specialty lines claims there's some gray area to it where there needs to be some negotiation and really focus on specific language. Hey everybody, Brian Hoagley, welcome back to CISO Life. Uh, another day, and we're going to talk about insurance. Uh, and believe it or not, you're going to want to actually stick around for this. Uh, I think we're going to get deep into a better understanding of what DNO insurance is. It's a hot topic lately for CISOs, young and old, new and not. And I am happily joined here today by Andrew Pendergast. He's managing director at NFP, one of the subject matter experts that I've come to know uh, about DNO insurance and insurance in general. So I'm lucky enough to have him in the studio today with us talking about this. Andrew, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Look forward to talking about insurance and trying to make it as exciting as possible. You know, people people don't really, I think, give insurance as like the fourth way to address risk. Um, it's credit. And uh, that's unfortunate because it saves a lot of people a lot of pain. And yet we kind of pass it off. I came out of the insurance space. I was a CISO at a Fortune 500 insurance company. So I know a thing or two, or at least I like to pretend to. Uh, but you being a practitioner and a broker and understanding the underwriting and that aspect of it, and obviously what clients are dealing with and individuals are dealing with, much, much deeper understanding, which is why I'm so glad that you're here with us to talk about this instead of me just pulling somebody out that I used to know that maybe isn't as qualified. Yeah, fair enough. I, I think insurance, um, you kind of think about it when you need it which is not right. necessarily always best practice, right? And it depends on the sophistication of the company too, how into the weeds they get uh, within their own insurance and risk management profile and purchasing trends, what have you, right? So it's a good topic to get out in front of and understand. I think to your point there, I don't wanna say there's a lot of misinformation about what directors and officers liability insurance is, but I don't think there's, a, especially at the small middle market kind of segment, um, a good enough grasp on what it, what it does and does not cover. So I think this is a great time. Let's kind of break this down a little bit. Um, you know, I'm a CISO at a, at a company and I know there's going to be maybe a little bit of a difference between if I'm a private company or a public company, sure. but you know, I'm a CISO. Um, how, how important it is, is it for me as I'm going for a job as a CISO at a company that uh, is hiring for that role? How important is it for me to consider the DNO insurance for the company and whether or not I'm covered by that. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's critical, I think, right? Ultimately, DNO insurance does a few things, right? It protects your personal assets as an individual, and it also protects the assets of the company in the form of the balance sheet if it has to indemnify you as an individual or if it has to indemnify the entity itself, if it's named in a suit, right? So as you're evaluating a position, whether it's on a board or an executive position or as a CISO, um, it's important to understand a couple of things. Um, DNO insurance really follows the line of indemnification. What I mean by that is uh, if the company is required to indemnify you as an individual in the event that you're sued, the DNO insurance will pick you up as an insured individual, right? So uh, making sure that as you're joining a firm or a company, whatever it's public or private, that you have proper indemnification agreements in place is really important because the DNO will follow that. Um, the DNO insurance itself, really is intended to protect you from a defense cost and a settlement perspective, whether you are indemnified or not, so long as you're an insured person, right? So um, you pointed out a few really notable claims for CISOs recently with Uber and SolarWinds, right? Where um, the SEC went after those individuals specifically, um, the defense cost and settlement on a properly negotiated policy would be covered um, for those individuals. So kind of stepping back to the line of the indemnification, right? So I get to use my magic board here, which is always fun. I'm the happy CISO, right? I'm getting, I'm getting the job at the company. Um, in my contract or my agreement with, with the company, mm -hmm. in this employment agreement here, right? Which is in, ideally all CISOs are getting. And as CISOs, we're all actually having our own personal lawyers look at this. We're not just accepting that the company's got our best interest. We're negotiating this. We've got our own personal lawyers looking at this. We're at that level, boys and girls, we should be playing that game. If we're doing this, in here are generally the clauses you see around liability or coverage for uh, liability or limits of liability and, and whatever that is. That's, is that what you're pointing to? Is that where that, that line starts? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. And again, right, it's, it would be very out of the norm 
right, for a company not to provide identification to any individual that they're employing. Right. I think it's very, very important for independent contractors, for example, if you're an outsourced CISO, to make sure that any sort of contract that you have uh, includes those indemnification agreements. And being somebody who runs a professional uh, outsourced CISO company, I can definitely tell you how important that actually is to get that into your MSAs, uh, any of the vCISO community out there, that's where that information is going to be in your MSA. When your client pushes back on certain things, these are those areas that you just say, no, like we can't, we can't do that. But let's go back to the employment piece as the CISO um, themselves. I have a lot of fun with this board, sorry. So if we're looking at the CISO, um, right, that role and taking the employment piece, um, there's a lot of discussion always kind of back and forth. I've seen in some private slacks, you know who you are, um, that, you know, if I'm not named an officer, right, mm -hmm. if I'm not a named officer by the company, but it sounded like, and just, you know, if I'm hearing what you're saying, actually it starts with this indemnification clauses in my employment agreement. Do I need to push to be a named officer at the company to be covered by DNO? You, you do not, right? So, and again, policies and language vary from carrier to carrier, right? Like the devil's in the details. Mm. Uh, a defined term within every single director's and officer's liability policy is, is insured person. Okay? Uh, generally speaking, that is any past, present, or future director, officer, employee uh, of the company. Um, and some will require that you are indemnifying those individuals for them to get picked up for coverage. Um, but the definition is intentionally broad to really make sure anybody who is working in their capacity at the company is covered under the policy to the extent that they are named in a suit. Got it. Got it. So that's, I think that's very important. I think there's a lot of people who are like pushing for this, like, well, you know, I need to, you know, actually a, a, a close friend of mine who's a CISO at an organization just actually pushed for this. Now it's a publicly traded <laughs> company. I think he wanted to make sure that, you know, he was an officer so that this was clear. I don't think that the liability of the indemnification and his employment agreement maybe was, was there. So he was, sure. he was just like, well, instead of re, you know, negotiating this employment agreement, let me make sure that I'm a named officer so I'm covered under the DNO. Is that yeah. one approach that you've seen or a scenario? It is. I think it's it's probably a little overkill. Like in, in reality, you don't really need to be doing that, right? The policy is intended to, to be broad enough to, to pick everyone up. I think okay. in some cases, just given the environment today, right, like you mentioned the cases before, potentially some fear mongering coming out of the insurance community that like you may not be covered and let's talk to you about your insurance policy, right? To start a conversation. Uh, when in reality, those individuals are picked up. Now, having said that, there's nothing wrong with lasering in language and adding endorsements if you feel necessary uh, that specifically either name individuals or name positions, right? For example, within the definition of insured person, it's not going to lay out chief information security officer, right? Right. Perhaps you want to add that. Uh, an insurance company will not have an issue with that. Okay. Now, conversely, I've actually heard this argument from, and this is kind of a um, scenario that I found kind of interesting because I, I, I understand and know what you're saying. So this scenario I'm about to say kind of caught me off guard. Somebody was going for a CISO role and said, hey, I want to be a named officer covered under the DNO. And the company was like, no, we're not going to do that. Should that be an interesting red flag or some type, something that you should want to dig in? And if you were going to dig in and kind of press it and say, okay, fine, you're not going to name me on your insurance policy for DNO, where would that person want to look to make sure that they are covered in some degree if they chose that they still wanted to work for this company? Is that where they come back to, hey, I want to make sure that there's indemnification clauses in my employment contract? Yeah, I would definitely look to the indemnification um it would strike me as as a definitely red flag if they're saying we're not going to have you covered under a director's and officer's policy for two reasons. One, it's protecting the company uh, if they're required to indemnify you, right? Again, a DNO insurance policy will reimburse the balance sheet of the company for the defense and settlement it pays on behalf of its individuals when they get sued. Excess of it is possible. So it's good protection for the company to make sure that you are covered under the policy. Um, but yes, the indemnification would need to be absolutely airtight in that perspective. I would also be concerned about what's the financial stability of the company. Um, if indemnification for whatever reason would not be available because of a default or bankruptcy, then you could really be kind of up the creek without a paddle for better right. terms. No, it's, uh, this is really good. So I think you know the CISO going for what they need to, I think that's clear. I want to dig into, you've brought up kind of A, B, and C side coverages. Yep. you know, where that plays into. So if we could kind of go into what are these A, B, and C side coverages for insurance, just so people better understand kind of the, the facets of DNO. Totally, absolutely. All right, so uh, standard DNO contract, right, uh, is combined of three sides of coverage, A, B, and C. 
Uh, we love our acronyms within the insurance community, so that's that's sure do. Fun, right. Um, side A insurance is what's known as personal asset protection. It's the most important coverage for individuals because, again, it's going to protect your personal assets. Uh, that comes into play in the event that you're named uh, as a defendant in a lawsuit, right? Or if you're being investigated as an individual and the company is either failing or refusing to indemnify you, okay? Um, whether that's because of bankruptcy or because they're just deciding we're not going to, even though they may be required to by law, right? So in the absence of insurance, you would have to go out of your own pocket for a defense and settlement. Side A steps in front of that. The second that you're not indemnified for any reason, the policy will begin paying on your behalf. There's no deductible for that coverage, mm -hmm. right? It's dollar one coverage. So that's side A, personal asset protection. Side B and side C are what we refer to as balance sheet protection because they, they reimburse the balance sheet of the company uh, in two scenarios. Um, side B insurance, same scenario, an individual insured an individual person is named in a suit, the company does indemnify them, right? Um, a deductible will have to be satisfied. That can vary widely, whether you're public, private, size of the company. Once that deductible is satisfied, the insurance company then basically steps in front of the indemnification you owe, starts paying on behalf of the company, okay? So that's side B, individual uh, insured balance sheet coverage. Side C uh, is entity coverage, and it depends on whether you're private or you're public. If you are a private company, side C is what we call true entity coverage, meaning that if the uh, entity itself is named as a, as a defendant, a subsidiary is named as a defendant, right? Um, the, the policy, again, excess of that deductible will pay the defense costs and settlement associated with defending and settling on behalf of the entity. If you are a public company, side C is limited only to securities class action claims coverage. So the entity only has coverage in the event that it's named a defendant in a securities class action claim. Yeah. And more often than not, right, B and C respond simultaneously. Okay. So in the right. event of a securities class action claim, right, you look at solar winds, um, entity named as well as individuals. And so you don't have to satisfy that deductible twice. It's one deductible and then you're right to the coverage. What's something I'm not asking about here? That's yeah. maybe a, a misnomer or kind of misunderstood area that you uh, you see people ask about or, or they have some assumptions about for coverages that don't actually exist. What's something that I'm missing that I don't know to ask about? Do you know? Yeah, it's a great question. So the, the first thing that comes to mind is investigations coverage, right? Both for the individuals and for the entity itself. Um, the policy language has certain triggers, right? That get you what we call get you into the policy, right? So you have to have a uh, a covered claim, right? Claim is a defined term uh, against an insured person or insured entity um, for loss, effectively, right? So claim wrongful, or excuse me, for a triggered wrongful act that results in loss, right? So you have to basically meet those three conditions. Uh, an investigation, right? does not necessarily allege any sort of wrongful act, right? Under the policy. Right. Um, the SEC may just send you a letter saying, hey, we want all of your books and records. We want these emails, right? With no really determination on, hey, we're gonna charge you or bringing any sort of charge. And so we call that somewhat informal investigations coverage for the individuals and for the entity. It's not automatically covered under a DNO policy. You have to negotiate that in. And mm -hmm. I think for specifically for today's conversation, when we look at, you know, things like the Wells notice that, you know, um, solar winds, solar received, winds got, yeah. individuals, right. You know, and other sort of SEC investigations, making sure that your policy includes those entity investigation, individual investigations coverage is really, really important because there could be a tremendous amount of cost incurred by the company prior to right. any charges being levied by the SEC. Yeah. Defense attorneys and lawyers are not cheap. Right. No. That's that's basically what we're looking for. That, that's generally kind of what you're looking at, the coverage, right? The, the legal means to defend either you, the person or the entity from the investigation. Like you said, not saying that there's necessarily wrongdoing, but they're considering it. They're <laughs> using the investigation to figure out has there been, but there's still you still need to be able to defend yourself through this entire thing. You don't wait until you're actually charged to start defending yourself. You need to if you have the opportunity to defend yourself when you get a Wells notice, it's probably good to jump on that train and start defending yourself then before you know, finding out that they went through and they yep. missed an opportunity, right? A hundred percent, right? And uh, like you mentioned, the cost to respond to that, hiring experts, just data collection, your lawyers, right? That can get pretty costly pretty quick before you even get to a formal capital C claim under the policy. Right. Excellent. Anything else I'm missing if I'm kind of considering this space as a, as a CISO? 
No, I think, you know, always nobody expects you to be an expert within insurance, right? You know, right. and I think the, the base question to always ask is, okay, do you have, do you know, insurance? If so, how much, right? Mm -hmm. Which is great. It's a good question to ask, right? Knowing that you have an adequate level of insurance is good. Adequate can mean a bunch of different things, right? If, depending on the size of the company, are you in tech, are you in healthcare, financial institution? Is it a riskier se sector, right? Like engage with a broker to help you evaluate that because just saying, okay, we have we have a million dollars in coverage. That might sound a lot to someone who never bought you know, insurance before, but it's not that much. And then the policy language, right? Get a copy of the policy if you can, right? I request that and then have somebody really take a look at that. Again, changing two words, or it's from, you know, X, Y, Z to, to four, or this or that, adding a couple of words here and there make a lot of difference within coverage of policy. So important to know. No, you, you hit on a, 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 a lot of great points in this space. And I think the last thing that you said is, you know, always engage with your broker to walk through the policy. And one thing that I learned, because um, my, my father happened to be in, in the insurance space, so I had some crazy dinner room conversations, you know, growing up, because uh, I grew up under an underwriter. Yeah. Um, you know, the broker should be able to walk you through a scenario that you have in your head and tell you whether or not that your current policy covers that scenario or not. And yeah. I think that's something that's very, very keen for both the CISO and anybody else in the C-suite to expect. I think the, the thinking in corporate America that I've seen, especially within mid-market, is this like insurance always should feel like getting auto insurance. And like, oh, I can just submit information and 25-year-old driving a red sports car is going to get X. And that's not the case with specialty lines and these other types of coverages. And we need to be able to talk to the experts. So engage your broker. If you don't have a good broker, call Andrew, right? Get, get, get on the phone with NFP. I'm not trying to plug you, but man, seriously, like, you know enough to be able to explain this to somebody who hasn't lived it. Uh, yeah. That's saying something. So you should be able to talk to your broker. If your broker can't walk you through a scenario, and I tell this to my clients, uh, if they can't walk you through a scenario, and we don't generally do kind of cyber uh, incidents, you need to look for a new broker, honestly. Uh, if they can't explain your situation and understand what your coverages are, what, what are they getting their commission for? So call people that know what they're doing, um, and I definitely endorse what, you, uh, what you're doing at NFP. So thank you so much for, uh, for being on and, and going over this. Um, any parting words, any, any final thoughts for the community? No, I mean, listen, this, you know, nobody expects anybody to be an expert on insurance, right? So as you point on engaging an expert, the same way I would engage a CISO if I was evaluating cybersecurity, right? Like get somebody that knows what they're talking about. This stuff can be very complex. It's not property insurance where your building burns down and you know exactly how much it costs to replace. A lot of DNO and specialty lines claims there's some gray area to it where there needs to be some negotiation and really focus on specific language so no this is fantastic i appreciate you kind of you having me on here and talking through all this stuff and to anybody out there that has any questions after this you know brian will drop my contact info feel free to shoot me a line i love talking about this stuff it will be in the information down below again i'm brian hoagley with CISO life thank you everybody so much for joining me and andrew as we talked about dno insurance you'll find us anywhere using hashtag CISO life you can follow me on side channel or anything down below on linkedin or the social medias Hope everybody's good. Be safe. Be good. We'll see you next time. Thanks.